Welcome to 2023. I've got a great subject, tables, that I believe you'll find very edifying for the new year. I'm looking forward to presenting how God uses many of the symbols that I will be discussing to give us knowledge of Jesus Christ and what he wants us to know. That said, please look at the screen or turn in your Bibles. I'm going to read out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. So God is making a contrast here that we need to pay attention to. What is it if we're not allowed to drink from the cup of devils or eat at the table of devils? We want to avoid that. So what does that mean to Christians spiritually? I show an image of Catholic communion with the Catholic wine uh, and goats looking on just as an example of how natural people interpret scriptures. And it's a shame because God teaches Christians through the power of the Holy Spirit and we learn spiritual things, which I'm going to discuss further. So I'm going to cover the subject of tables. What's a good table and what is a bad table? And then I'm going to give some spiritual vocabulary, uh, quite a bit of it, that I believe will help everyone. If you pause and study, uh, it will be a great lesson, and it will allow you to get some deeper discernment as you read the rest of the Bible, God's Word, based on the Lord's gifts spiritually to you. I'm going to take some selected verses and discuss those. I'm going to discuss briefly a self-study. Uh, everyone is responsible as a Christian to study your Bibles, not just read, but study them, and uh, pray and ask God to give you spiritual insight into uh, the knowledge that he wants you to have. And then I'll make a brief conclusion. So, that said, tables. I'm going to start by reading the very top, Ephesians chapter 6. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. God makes it very clear that the enemies of the Christian faith, or for that matter anyone that's here on earth, would be spiritual enemies, spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, high places not only literally, but spiritually, where money and power and influence can be found in this world. And evil spirits are behind the power. It's not just smart people or great people. It's spiritual wickedness that is manipulating people to influence the masses, is one way I look at this. In Proverbs chapter 23, it says, When thou sittest, to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee. I invite everyone to pause and read the rest of Proverbs uh, 23. It is important to this lesson uh, because this is going into when a person of influence starts talking about Jesus Christ and telling you about uh, how to get saved or what is, you know, the Word of God, and here's how we practice our religion, you have to consider what they're saying, and you have to weigh in the balances what's coming out of their mouths. Does it measure up against God's counsel? Because oftentimes it does not. Uh, Lucifer, the God of this world, uses people in positions of influence, in particular religious influence, to mislead people. And he rewards them oftentimes with earthly treasures, uh, giving them wealth or, or influence, whatever they desire, as an illusion of doing God a service, when in reality they're in full rebellion against the Most High. So I show some images here. Um, one in particular on the top of the screen would be a crucifix, with a gold, like a golden cup of wine and a, an unleavened 
uh, communion host being held by a priest who's trying to convince his audience that he has the magical power to change all these things, the, the wine and the unleavened bread, into the literal flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. Well, if you need that in a service in order, or a mass, for example, in order to be saved, to, to fulfill where Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh or drink my blood, you have no life in you, then you're relying now on a priest to have magical power to make that happen, rather than the only mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, as it says in the New Testament. So that's one example of being manipulated by a religious leader, in this case a, uh, an associate of the Babylonian church, which is the church of Satan, telling you about Jesus. But it doesn't end there. If you look below, uh, Christians associate the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ with the scriptures, with Bibles, because Jesus says, by my words are you clean, and he washes us with his words. That's how you're born again, not of corruptible, but of incorruptible seed, the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So if you go out into the world and look for the word of God, are you going to find it? Especially if the Lord tells us there's a devastating famine, and if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. I submit to you that Satan is trying to keep people from coming to faith, and uh, one of the ways that that's done is corrupting the word of God. So if you have a pastor or a religious leader uh, telling you about Jesus, we have to take it back to, well, what Jesus are they telling you about? What is their foundation of belief in? What It all goes back to the word of God. What do they identify as the word of God? And do they allow papal concessions or Babylonian concessions to break the scripture in the word that they subscribe to. Questions that everyone professing a belief in Christianity should be asking themselves. So here, what I want to do is the subject matter is tables. So a table would represent a Bible. I'm just going to go straight down the column there, or a lamp or a vessel. They're all spiritually synonyms of each other. And if you look at the rows, you know, a table is the Lord's Supper, how you eat spiritual food to get saved, if you believe. And a bad table would be famine. So you've got the good table being the Lord's Supper, the bad table being a famine. And if you look underneath those columns, the good things, like lamps have oil in them, that's because God says if they do, you can be saved. Uh, Bibles that are incorruptible provide salvation. It's the true word of God. Vessels that are honorable or have honor, same thing. In contrast, uh, when you have a famine, you have a lamp without oil, wasn't written by the Holy Ghost, according to Matthew chapter 25, or you have a corruptible Bible, according to, well, take a look at the reference I have there in First Peter, but also Second Corinthians chapter 2 verse 17 would be another place you could go. And then there's vessels of dishonor, as it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2. So this kind of sets up the lesson today of basic vocabulary that you need to know if you're going to follow along the subject matter of tables. Speaking of vocabulary, I've got a chart here where table is defined in a natural sense as a place to put food. And we can all identify a lot of people watching, you know, especially on New Year's Day, you get your family together and you put your food on the table, you pour drinks, and uh, you enjoy each other's company. And, and at least that's been a New Year's Day tradition in my household. Um, spiritually, what does this all mean? Belief in the Bible. Belief in the Word of God. A table is uh, basically uh, where food, spiritual food, is going to be placed, and you either believe or you don't. Belief could be disbelief or real belief. And then I'll let you guys look and study and pause. I gave some verses for examples that uh, explain this, the terms that I'm using here. I'm going to go down to snares and nets. Those are literally 
in a natural sense, traps for catching, whether it's birds or fish or whatever. Um, but spiritually, it's symbolic of idolatry, corruption of the word, or it could be a conviction. When you're in a net, you could be convicted by some type of belief. It could be a good conviction, or it could be a bad conviction. Hearts uh, would be bowels, blood supply to the rest of the body in a natural sense. Uh, in a spiritual sense, a heart is associated with belief. It could be a good heart or a bad heart, good belief or bad belief. Vomit would be the ejection of food and drink from your stomach. I don't think I need to explain vomiting any further. I think most people are familiar with it. But spiritually, it means rejection of words. Now, you could be rejecting bad words or good words, depending on how God is using it. Cup is a vessel for holding liquid. A cup could be a body or a Bible, a container for holding doctrine, for example, spiritually. Bread is food made from grain. Uh, bread, spiritually, is the word of God. Uh, meat, food, word of God, same thing. Wine would be alcoholic juice. That's my definition, at least. And uh, spiritually, it means doctrine that you get from words. Wipe is cleaning your mouth after eating. So when, when you're done eating your food, you, you wipe your mouth with a napkin. Spiritually, what does wipe mean? A professing of, of some type of belief. Once you hear a testimony, and that, that testimony you're consuming spiritual food, once you hear it, if you're a true believer, there'll be salvation. And if you're professing a false belief, there won't be anything. Uh, you'll just stay static. But that's what wipe indicates. Mouth is an entry point for food. Mouth spiritually is how you're able to confess, confess whether a person is saved or not. The mouth is everything. It, it confesses the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit only. You can't confess Jesus Christ with your mouth except you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's something that a lot of professing believers don't realize, but that's what God says. Continuing on with uh, vocabulary relevant to the topic of tables, you've got spices. Spices, on an, in a natural sense, make food taste better. Uh, and I think almost everyone uses some type of spice to enhance the flavor of their food. Spiritually, that could mean enticing words softly spoken. A lot of times it is a flattering tongue that makes God's word more palatable through corruption or through some type of false explanation. Not always. Spices could sometimes uh, indicate a good thing, depending on the context. But most of the time, spices indicate enticing words softly spoken, a flattering tongue that is lying about God. Candles would be light in appearance, spiritually, the word of God, or Christ. Most often, symbolic of the true Lord Jesus Christ. Cloth, covering for table, spiritually, it's a covering of righteousness, usually. Um, your, your covering is your righteousness, your salvation, if you believe the word of God. Water uh, naturally is something that we drink to quench thirst. We need water. Our body is made up of a high percentage of water. Uh, spiritually, the water indicates the word of God. Uh, sitting is a typical position when, that we are in when we're eating food. Not always, but most of the time when you eat, you're sitting. Uh, spiritually, that means you're consuming doctrine. It could be good doctrine or it could be bad doctrine. The false church Babylon likes to think they're consuming good doctrine, but they're not. They're, uh, they're a widow, as it says in Revelation chapter 18, because they're, they're being seduced by a flattering tongue and believing on a false Christ. Bowl is a food container, symbolic of the word of God. Tongs would be a food or cold coal handler. So sometimes people use tongs to move or manipulate uh, coals when they're cooking. Sometimes they use tongs to uh, manipulate or move food when they're cooking. Spiritually, what does it mean? To deliver the word. Could be a good word or a bad word. Wood 
is just simply a material of table of tables. Um, and what it means spiritually is idolatry or belief. You may have a false belief oftentimes uh, when God uses wood. It is oftentimes, but not always, uh, indicative of some type of contention against God or idolatry. Stone is a material of, ta of tables. They would be very hard tables. Um, stone represents word or belief, but most often in the context of stone representing a place where uh, there's spiritual food, it is a hardened state where a person is going to be stuck in disbelief to the Most High. They're going to be trapped in a false belief system. Sweet or, or desserts, uh, if it's the last thing that people typically eat uh, at a formal dinner. Uh, it's the end of dining. It's a treat, considered a treat. You know, whether you have a piece of cake or pie for dessert, it's something that everyone looks forward to to finish their dinner. Well, in the case of how it spiritually represents, discernment or delight. You've consumed your food, and at the end of consuming your food, you have some type of discernment. It could be good discernment or not so good discernment. You either delight in the precepts of the Most High, or you delight in your own natural understanding. But this is what happens spiritually after a person consumes some type of spiritual food. So hopefully that helps everyone. I gave plenty of cross-references in scripture. Be great to pause and study. And also, most importantly, to pray about this topic as everyone is responsible to develop your own spiritual vocabulary based on the gifts that God is giving you through his spirit. I'm going to talk about tables a little more. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says, For as much as ye are manifestly declared, to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. This is interesting because the Ten Commandments were written on tables of stone, and uh, the law is very grievous, and the law has not been done away with. It's just been fulfilled by Jesus Christ. But everyone that's unsaved is still under the law, which is grievous, and no flesh is justified by it. So God makes it very clear, you must be born again and receive the Holy Spirit by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, or you cannot be saved. So tables, uh, in the Old Testament, the law was written on literal stone tables. Um, and in the New Testament, it's revealed that that spiritually set up a fulfillment of the law that people could be declared righteous by being born again of God's Spirit by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? You believe on his word um, and his incorruptible word, for that matter. Lamps with oil in them. And when that happens, you should feel some type of sorrow or grief God will chasten everyone based on his will, based on what he has a purpose for that person in their life. So tables. Tables to a Christian would represent your heart. And let's hope that that heart is in, in, with one accord with the gospel. The mouth. Mouth is very important. It says in Matthew chapter 12, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Uh, Jesus makes it very clear how people give themselves away, whether you're a saved Christian or you're a heathen that may profess to be a Christian. Uh, you can't fool the Lord. And we who have the Holy Spirit can weigh in the balances what comes out of people's mouths and get great discernment whether or not they're saved. Um, earlier I mentioned that a person can only confess Jesus by the Holy Spirit and we should be able to recognize whether a person is confessing Jesus by the Holy Spirit or not based on what comes out of their mouth. It says in James chapter 5, But above all things my brethren swear not, neither by heaven, 
neither by earth, by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. That's something that we all need to take very seriously. God says condemnation. Uh, condemnation being associated with being unsaved, suffering an eternity in the lake of fire. So God doesn't want anybody to swear according to James chapter 5. Well, looking over at Zechariah chapter 5, it says, Then said he unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. So the curse was explained in Numbers chapter 5, but the curse is for anyone that doesn't get saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, For everyone that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side, according to it, and every one that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side, according to it. This is called wormwood, a bitter, sharp as a two-edged sword, final prayer book delivered up uh, into the hand of the king of Babylon through an assembly of nations, according to what God's testimony is. Okay, but it shows people swearing, and they fall into condemnation because they were given to the curse. They'd never received the Holy Spirit. In Matthew above it, chapter 15, it says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. So Jesus Christ makes it very clear that what comes out of your mouth defiles. And he's talking about taking a natural body, and what comes out of a natural body after you eat. Okay? That the Lord is comparing to someone who is not saved, what comes out of their mouth defiles them. Okay? He's, he's basically telling us it's the same thing. And if you're a false professing believer or even a heathen that doesn't believe anything, every word will be uh, judged. You will be accountable for every word that you've spoken. So the words will condemn people. So if you get all worked up about being caused to receive a mark, remember what that cause is. And what the Lord says will cause it. The disbelief in the Lord Jesus Christ, the failure to receive the Holy Spirit by believing in the true word of God, ultimately will leave unsaved people completely vulnerable to receiving a mark. Is it a spiritual mark? Pray and study your Bibles. Wine. In John chapter 4, it says, So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. Uh, wine is a very powerful symbol spiritually in the Bible. And it says in Psalm uh, 75, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. Uh, those that are familiar with the entire canon of Scripture knows that uh, the Lord has a cup of red wine in his hand, and the earth is drunk because of the words of his holiness. If you don't believe God, then you are going to be drunk because you don't believe in the truth, is what it comes down to. So wine, as I mentioned earlier, is symbolic of doctrine that one gets from believing on a word, either corruptible or incorruptible okay so if it's wine that you're drinking and it says drink a little wine for thy stomach's sake for thy infirmities it's that you're consuming wine in accordance with god's will you're not drunk spiritually because you believe on his doctrine on the lord jesus christ so wine is used extensively as a symbol and it's oftentimes bad, sometimes it's not bad. But uh, it's very important to understand that it's uh, representing doctrine. Snares. It says in Romans chapter 11, And David saith, Let their table be made a snare and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Remember what a table is. Table ultimately is a place where food is placed in a spiritual sense it's 
uh, the heart, the belief condition of the heart. Okay, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 it says, For man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time, when it falleth suddenly upon them. So snares, what do snares represent? I'm going to continue reading and then I'll discuss it. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7 it says, And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, and her hands is bands. Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. I'm going to talk in spiritual terms. Okay, The woman is Babylon, the false church that reigns over the kings of the earth that has made everyone drunk because of God's word as the standard, the Babylonian church has caused disbelief throughout the world, and if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived. That's how devastating the famine is and the time of deception according to the Lord Jesus Christ. So God uses uh, symbols such as snares to indicate ultimately a snare is that of disbelief. That's man's problem ever since Genesis chapter 3, the problem of disbelief in the words of the Most High. So that's what a snare is in a negative sense, and uh, would be the same as a net being caught in a state of disbelief before your natural death is over. You don't want to be caught in a state of disbelief. You want to be born again, even if you're born again at a very old natural age. Uh, that way you can uh, be saved and live forever in the kingdom of heaven as opposed to suffering an eternity of condemnation in the lake of fire. Matthew chapter 24, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. It says down at the bottom, again in Matthew chapter 24, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Do, do you know anyone that believes these verses? And have you ever met anyone that's thinks that they've been deceived. What is a false Christ? Well, natural people don't understand what I'm going to say. You have to have a spiritual uh, discernment through God's power. So many will come talking about Jesus being the Savior, but they'll deceive many because they're going to present a false Christ. Most often, they do it through giving people false Bibles, false testimonies, because they themselves are not saved. How do you get a false Christ? You just leaven the lump. You change the scripture. You break the scripture that cannot be broken, but you break it anyway. And you start changing a word here and there. And now you've got a false Christ because the scripture cannot be broken. And then God will punish people. They will have no spiritual discernment. And uh, if there's no oil in their lamp, they're never going to get saved. According to Matthew chapter 25, the following chapter. Every man is a liar, according to, I believe it says that in the book of Romans. So, people will deceive in the name of Jesus Christ, and false prophets are going to be so deceptive, uh, due to biblical corruption primarily, that if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived. Now, God has a dross removal system built into the text, that if you have the Holy Spirit, he will lead you to all truth and get the dross out of your biblical vessel so that the vessel, the spiritual vessel, as a reborn Christian, can be profitable and not suffer loss uh, during the time of Christian judgment. So I just wanted to present this as this is the news that God gives us. Does the world present this? The world manipulates God's word and turns it into a fallacy. So how do they do that? Just disseminating propaganda. Uh, you look at Job chapter 41, verse 19 is one example. Um, and we know that 
Satan's ministers will masquerade as they were ministers of righteousness, according to the New Testament. So the world delivers a fake news or a fake testimony, ultimately a false Christ. And if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived. So if you truly believe that, you want to pray and study and trust the Most High to lead you to all truth so you don't suffer loss. I am taking some information that I have previously presented and putting it here because I think it fits in very well to the topic of tables and also what I was talking about in terms of false prophets and false Christ. Here's how deceptive things are. The very top of the screen here, in the top row, uh, you've got the AV1611, the English Bible, that I recognize by God's power as the Word of God, the unbroken testimony of Jesus Christ. It's been repackaged as the King James Bible, and it's not the same testimony. There, there are pronoun changes. I think I highlighted a couple of them there. And uh, there's a lot of subtle differences uh, throughout the text. And those differences make a huge uh, difference to God. And all of us understand only by the power of the Holy Spirit. So if we don't have any ability to naturally under, understand the Word of God apart from being taught by the Holy Spirit, then we ought to be very fearful of getting a false testimony. And then I show, highlighted in pink, beneath four different Bibles, official Bibles of the Catholic Church, and how the text was very subtly manipulated and changed. And then beneath that, in orange, there's one, two, three, four, five, six Bibles that are associated with being Protestant or Christian Bibles, non-Catholic Bibles. And if you study all of these word changes, you'll find in many cases they follow the textual chains, uh, changes of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, God talks about this extensively in his word. The Catholic Church is called Babylon, the mother of harlots. She gives birth to false churches, uh, and this is a problem all throughout the world. So um, a lot of different word changes here with a lot of different meanings that basically the, the, the people are, that are using these false Bibles are arguing among themselves about natural differences in the words. Well, reprove and expose doesn't mean a whole lot of difference to a natural person, so they are feeling free to use different words there when it means everything to God. And they don't even see a spiritual testimony. So if you start changing one thing and you don't get a spiritual testimony, you keep dumbing down these dumb idols until your natural testimony of a natural false Christ makes more sense to you. But there'll never be any end to it because they'll keep dumbing down the testimony because God's word can't, can't be broken. And once it's broken, the king of Babylon takes over and keeps them in a never-ending loop of confusion. So this is something where people can pause and study all these different changes. Um, a couple of them that are notable would be Antichrist. Out of his mouth go burning lamps in Job chapter 41 verse 19. That's uh, in reference to counterfeiting the word of God and creating all these false Bibles. And it was changed from lamp to torch uh, sometime in the middle of the 20th century by the Catholic Church, the Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition, came out, heavily influenced from the Vatican and Synatic Manuscripts, which were allegedly discovered, you know, and professed to be the most ancient manuscripts on earth. But God also talks about this in the same chapter of Job. He says that, you know, the heathens, the Babylonians, under the direction of their false Christ, Leviathan, will think the ancient um, things related to God uh, will, will give great counsel, but they're false. He's telling us that, uh, I think it says that the deep would be hoary. Well, the deep is the counsel in the heart of men, the heart being the table, and hoary would mean ancient. But 
God's word is the most ancient, and it's been preserved throughout the generations. Uh, and we have a preserved, uh, unbroken scripture in the English language today. So God talks about how Antichrist man manipulates his word and comes up with false testimonies. He tells you everything you need to know as a Christian throughout his word, and there's a lot of good spiritual information in Job chapter 41 regarding this subject. But the natural people are reading about dinosaurs, crocodiles, things like that. So, you know, they're, they're, they're in an endless loop of confusion, and they'll never know the spiritual things of God because they are not born again. Um, I'll talk about Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. If you go left quite a bit, uh, gods, plural. Um, it's always been plural. Uh, the lie of the serpent was, ye shall be as gods. And it was always phonetically the same until once again around the middle of the 20th century where suddenly it became singular. Uh, God, ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. Well, that wasn't a lie. That would be the truth according to what happens in Genesis chapter 3 later on in the chapter. So Christians know this stuff. The heathens don't. Then it comes down to, uh, uh, you know, there's no dispute. It should be God's plural. But then whether or not it's a capital G or a lowercase g becomes the point of contention. Uh, uh, capital G, gods, means deities. Lowercase g, gods, means creations. And it's defined as such. So if you uh, know that the devil, there is no truth when he speaks, then it eliminates the lower g. And the uppercase g, plural, becomes the only true testimony in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, with regards to how the serpent deceived the woman. So that's my commentary there. Christians that receive the Holy Spirit, you'll be able to pray and get this stuff. You may already understand this. If you have not received the Holy Spirit, but you are interested in being saved and you truly believe the Word of God, you just haven't had access to it, then pray about this and get yourself an AB 1611 Bible. Uh, very easy to come by. Look it up. If, uh, if you have any needs, look at the previous videos that I put out. I've got an address that you can write to to get a free Bible if that is your choice. Okay, and then where is this all leading? All the way up to the final book of wisdom or the final prayer book that God warns everybody about called Wormwood, Abomination of Desolation. Uh, it's going to blaspheme God to the point where there will be no repentance from it, but yet at the same time it will be so believable to natural people that unless you have the Holy Spirit guarding your tongue, everyone is going to confess this as the Word of God, God says it in Zechariah chapter 5. People will swear that it's the word of God. They will swear an oath because it will be accompanied by signs and lying wonders that could deceive everyone that's not sealed by the Holy Spirit. And the only way that Christians are not going to confess this is because of that. The Holy Spirit will guard their tongues. Okay, so those are my I have additional comments down at the bottom in the light yellow, uh, you can read, pause, and study uh, as you are convicted. In Matthew chapter 24, it says, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. So my comment would be, that's what you do when you're sitting at a table. And the table is your, is your heart, and the table is a state of belief. Okay, so... Our people, for the most part in the world, don't believe the true testimony of Jesus Christ. Marrying and giving in marriage, well, you know, when you get saved, you're, you're going to be part of the bride of Christ. So think about spiritually, not just naturally what's going on. I show an image of people eating and drinking here, but think about what this means spiritually. Until that day that No entered into the ark. Now the ark represents the word of God, and No is a spelling change of Noah, which represents the body of Christ. 
and knew not until the flood came, the flood out of the serpent's mouth, per revelation, I can't remember what chapter it's in, uh, I think uh, out of the mouth of the serpent came a flood to carry away the woman, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but the flood is symbolic of false decrees, the bitter water that comes out of the serpent's mouth, the water being symbolic of the word of God or a false word, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So nobody is going to realize when the return of Jesus is. Uh, there are some that are Christians that have spiritual gifts that get discernment that will recognize the abomination of desolation as probably one of the only signs that the end is near. Uh, but it's going to carry almost everyone away unexpectedly because that's what the Lord has said in his testimony. So in conclusion, we don't want to be drunk on wine. We don't want to be dining on corruptible food. We want a table of belief, a heart that believes the true word of God, and we consume it with faith so that we can be saved and be profitable for uh, God's purpose for our lives here on earth, the short time that we're here. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you want to make sure you separate the word, the good table from the bad table. Get your heart in a condition of belief and pray about it so that you can be profitable. But you need to study your Bibles, not just read them. God uses the word study to indicate that the Holy Spirit will lead you in accordance with his will, oftentimes precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. When I first got saved, the first book I read was the book of Proverbs, gave me a, a nice amount of spiritual vocabulary, so that as the Holy Spirit led me through the rest of the Bible, in accordance with his will, by the way, not mine, I was able to discern things and understand prophecies, as opposed to if I just read it from you know, Genesis chapter 1 all the way through the end of Revelation chapter 22, maybe I don't pick that up. But I trusted the Lord to teach me and to have me study the Bible, not just read it his way, not the way that men would have counseled me to. It says down at the bottom, 1 John chapter 2, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches to you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Okay, so you don't want somebody with a false professing belief misleading you. You want to get your doctrine from the Lord, and when other Christians that have the Holy Spirit in them are able to help facilitate the process of studying and understanding scriptures, that's called edification. Because in this case, it's not me that is teaching anyone. It is me being born again of the Spirit, sharing freely what I have been taught by the Lord, by His power, by His Spirit. So it's called edification. So, uh, you know, just take heed that no man deceive you. And take everything back to scripture and... Look at certain places like Isaiah chapter 28 so that you understand how God reveals his word, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Uh, the Holy Ghost actually put in my mind exactly that shortly after I was saved, that he's going to take me around the word of God and show me how there are accounts uh, that span, there are lessons that span over many, many books and the way God writes is not understood by natural men. So, um, I hope you find this information beneficial. So, in conclusion, a table is symbolic of belief in God's word. The table is furnished with things needed to survive in a natural sense. You know, we put food and drink on our tables, and we dine because we need to sustain our natural bodies. Uh, spiritually, you need to have eternal life or, or it, being saved in the kingdom of heaven. Otherwise, the default is an eternity 
in the lake of fire, a condemnation uh, that no one wants to face. Many are taken by the snare of a bad table, which is idolatry because of their disbelief in the true Lord Jesus Christ. Do not let the world lead you into a false belief on a false Christ. Believe in the incorruptible word of God. And I'm assuming most people watching probably have received the Holy Spirit, but you also have an awareness that many people that you know have not received the Holy Spirit and you love your neighbor. So get the truth out to them. Tell them how serious God is about his word and don't let anyone fall into the folly of idolatry without at least hearing the truth of the testimony that you can deliver to them. Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you guys for watching and listening, and I'll look forward to another lesson sometime later this month.